When the Legends Die, Chapter 38 Most of the first week he existed in the half-world of the critically hurt, where there was neither night nor day, time nor reality, but only the overlapping periods of confused consciousness and dreams and nightmares. His body fought its battles quite apart from his mind. The transfusions, the injections, the x-rays, and the merciful surgery were performed on flesh and blood and bone, temporarily cut off from the normal processes of awareness. He roused enough from time to time to sense his hospital surroundings and feel the deep, insistent throb of pain in his head and the dull, remote pain elsewhere. But reality never quite overcame the dreams and nightmares, Dreams of boyhood, of his mother in the mountains, of the reservation, Red Dillon's place, and the backcountry rodeos. And always the dreams came to a chilling nightmare of falling, of being trapped in the saddle on a bronc that was forever falling, but never landing. Slowly, his vitality reasserted itself. As his awareness increased, he was restless and resentful. The stir and activity of the ward rasped at his nerves, and when he was lucid enough to enforce his demands, they moved him to a private room six floors above the street. There, the first morning of his second week, he wakened at dawn and saw the flame of sunrise in the small patch of sky beyond his window. He watched it, and the memory of another dawn came to him, the dawn where he and his mother, on the flight from Pagosa, bathed in the icy pool of a brook, then sat naked on the rocks and sang the chants to a new day. The rhythm of that chant throbbed in his memory like his own heartbeat for a few moments. Then he tried to move, and pain stabbed at his chest and hips, and bitterness rose in his throat, like his own gorge. He was no longer a boy or a breech-cloud Indian. He was a grown man in another world, a bronc rider trapped by his own injuries in a world of pain and helplessness. He was still rankling when a nurse came in. She was plump and had coppery hair and blue eyes and looked to be in her mid-thirties. She said, "'Good morning. How are we today?' And he immediately resented her ready smile and bubbly air. He frowned at her and did not answer. She lowered the window shade and started to put a thermometer into his mouth. "'Pull up the shade,' he ordered. "'But the sun is right in your eyes.' "'I like the sun. Put it up.' She laughed at him, raised the shade again, then took his temperature and his pulse. She straightened his bed, deft and efficient, then said, You must be starved. What would taste good for breakfast? I'm not hungry. How about poached eggs? I said I'm not hungry. You will be. Nothing tastes good in the hospital, but you have to eat, and poached eggs go down easy. She filled his water glass and left the room. A little later, she came back with a tray of toast, poached eggs, and coffee, arranged them on the bed table, saw that he took two capsules, happy pills to sweeten your disposition, and went away. The coffee tasted the way burning hay smelled, and he had a flash of memory of the night he burned the barn. Then he remembered the strong, bitter coffee Mio used to make, and the bite of Mio's chili, and the whole remembrance of the place on the San Juan came to back to him. He thrust the memories away and ate the toast and the eggs, hungry as the nurse had said he would be. Then he slept. The next morning, when the copper-haired nurse came in and asked him how he was, he demanded, What's your name? Mary Redman. She moved to, the low, to lower the window shade. Leave the shade alone. Where are you from? Massachusetts. She came back to his bedside. That's New England. It, wasn't, it was an accusation. About as New England as you can get. She put the thermometer into his mouth and counted his pulse. Then she took the thermometer again. He said, I used to have a mealy mouth school teacher who looked a little like you and talked like you. She was from New England. She laughed. You're talkative this morning. You must be feeling better. She began making his bed. When she had finished and folded the blanket across the foot of the bed, she asked, Where did you know this charming school teacher from New England? In Colorado, on the reservation. Oh? She went to get him a fresh glass of water. When she came back, he repeated sharply, On the reservation. I heard you the first time. Well? Look, Chief, you'd just as well put away your tomahawk and take the feathers out of your hair. This is a hospital, not a reservation. And you're just another man to me. Anything else I can do for you? No, leave me alone. That afternoon, Dr. Ferguson, the surgeon, came in to see him. 
Dr. Ferguson was a tall, lean man with a lean face and a clipped voice that Tom remembered vaguely, but this was the first time he had been well enough to ask questions. While the surgeon was taking his pulse, Tom asked, Ribs? The surgeon nodded. How many? Several. Follow my hand. He moved his hand from side to side in front of Tom's face. Tom followed it with his eyes for a moment, then closed them, dizzy. How's the nausea? Thrown up today? No. What else beside the ribs? The surgeon watched him for a moment, then said, A lung punctured, deep concussion, a broken femur, and a broken pelvis. Is that all? Isn't that enough? Do you want a broken back, too? How long will I be laid up? Till your pelvis knits. Six weeks or so. We've pinned your femur. That's the big bone in your thigh. You can walk again as soon as your pelvis knits. How soon can I ride again? Never, if you take my advice. I didn't ask for advice. Well, you got it. As far as the injuries go, the lung puncture is healing properly. You're almost over the effects of the concussion, but broken bones don't knit overnight, as you must know. I see from your x-rays that you've had quite a few in the past, but you seem to heal fast and your bones probably knit fast. They do. Well, in another six weeks, you should be able to walk out of here. Beyond that, it's up to you. I'll walk out and I'll ride again. Dr. Ferguson shrugged and left the room. That night, Tom had the dream and nightmares again. He wakened and tried to remember the last ride. All he could remember was right there in the nightmare, being trapped in the saddle and the big roan falling, falling, never coming down.